Welcome again to Mysterious Chicago. I'm Adam Seltzer from Mysterious Chicago Tours. Uh, we just announced our first two public tours. Uh, one is going to be a, uh, an H.H. Holmes Myth and Mystery Tour. I've been doing H.H. Holmes tours around the city for almost 10 years now. Um, I could just talk about the guy for hours on end. I will sometime in an upcoming podcast, too. Um, but right after that, like immediately after, we're going to be doing a short Unsolved Mysteries of Chicago tour on a bus. This is all going to be on December 12th. Uh, you can go to MysteriousChicago.com and get all of the details. Uh, Unsolved Mysteries is a route I've been putting together. There's a few different routes for it because there are so many great stories from Chicago history that involve uh, Unsolved Mysteries. Even if the, the main larger mystery was solved, like who killed who, a lot of times there's little side mysteries mysteries attached to it that we can't quite solve yet, stuff that we're still working on. Uh, one of these is uh, the story of George W. Green, which is uh, the subject of today's podcast. Now, this is a story three weeks ago. I knew nothing about this guy. Uh, it was just uh, quite by chance I ran into uh, mentions about him twice in one week and decided to look into it and found one of those incredible stories that I can't believe we forgot about. It's I, I couldn't believe I didn't know this story, except for the fact that nobody's really written anything about this guy in like a century, century and a half. But anyway, the other day I was in the microfilm room. I was uh, there to look up something else. I was looking up some uh, data on runaway slave cases in Chicago, which is a topic that's just been fascinating me lately. But nearby, one of the articles I was looking at was a little thing about the George W. Green poisoning case. And I took a picture of it and put it in my Learn More file. And then when I was looking up a different case online, I found another reference to George Green in another paper, and I decided it was time to get to work. Now, it turns out George Green was a man who was arrested for poisoning his wife in 1854 in his house down at 12th and Loomis, um, which would now be Roosevelt and Loomis. Now, in a drawing, it looks like a farmland off on the prairie at the time. Now, in any case, one day George Green's wife died, and he told everybody that she had died of cholera which wasn't a particularly bold claim to make at the time. People died of cholera all the time, and they tended to die of cholera very quickly. Like uh, Charles Hull's son, Charles M. Hull, uh, was fine one morning, and by afternoon he was dead of cholera. But, now, Green's brother-in-law suspected him right away. Apparently, he'd uh, never trusted Green to begin with, and since he'd always been such a jerk. And also, his six-year-old started showing uh, his friends this empty bottle that he said contained some sort of mysterious medicine that his father had poured down his mother's throat right before she died. You know, kind of suspicious. So a sheriff came to talk to Green, and when Green answered the door, he was holding up a rifle ready to shoot, which is a pretty good clue that the guy was up to no good. Now, by this time, Green had already buried his wife out in his garden. But the body was exhumed and tested. Green was put on trial. It's kind of a landmark case because there was this guy, Dr. James Blaney, who uh, did a lot of the testing on the internal organs. Then he went into great detail about how he used analytical chemistry to show that she had died of strychnine, of poison. Now, this was very new at the time, and the whole of his testimony was repeated and reprinted in medical journals and legal journals all over the place. It's very easy to find online now. Now, reading over it now, it's uh, kind of impossible to imagine that the jury would have had the faintest idea what he was talking about when he talked about, like, the crystallization patterns of uh, strychnine and acids and alkalides and all of these things. But they were suitably impressed to, convin to convict Green of murder, and I guess Green even shook Blaney's hand and said he was really impressed. Um, now, if they had hanged George Green, it would have been 1855. It would have been the first hanging we'd had in about 15 years in Chicago, which back at a time when they were still public, it was still a few years before they would start doing private executions in the city. Uh, and the next year, when they a year or two later when they had one, they were getting crowds in like the 10,000 range to, to watch public hanging. So people were kind of excited about this. But before they could have the hanging, uh, Green hanged himself in prison. He uh, ripped up his pajamas into a rope and uh, hanged himself from the bars of the prison. And within a few days after his death, there was a book on the streets about it. There was an actual book. Uh, that's where I'm getting most of this information from, besides the newspaper articles. There was this book, The Life of the Chicago Banker George W. Green, alias Oliver Gavitt, who was found guilty of poisoning his wife and committed suicide by hanging in the Cook County Jail. That's the title. 
Uh, this came out in 1855. It is probably the first true crime book, book in Chicago. It's like 50 pages long, hardbound, in this flimsy newsprint paper. As near as I could tell, there are only a couple of copies of it uh, still extant. Uh, one they have at the, sh the library of the Chicago History Museum, and the other is the, in the special collections room down at the University of Chicago Library, which is where I went. And they were gracious enough to let me see it and copy it all down for a couple hours. It's, it's always fun going into these special collections rooms. You know, they have you sit there, they bring the book out for you in a box, they've got little pillows set up for it. Now, the, the champion of all of these is the Newberry Library, right? across the street from Bug House Square. Now, they have got a copy of the Shakespeare First Folio of 1623, a first edition of uh, most of Shakespeare's plays. Now, this is worth, of course, millions of dollars. I think like 500 copies of it were printed, about 300 are known to exist. It's ridiculously expensive. They don't just keep it under glass. They bring it out to you. There's like a whole ritual for setting up the pillows and everything for it. They bring it out to you. They let you uh, read it and touch it and smell it. Um, if you want to, you can you can smell it. It smells like bowling shoes. Um, but anyway, the uh, George Green book is about 50 pages long. Uh, I was able to copy down everything from it out of the uh, University of Chicago Library. And the book is quite a yarn. It portrays George Green, the banker, as this Dickensian villain. There's all these scenes of him torturing animals, a lot of scenes where he tortures animals. Uh, there's scenes where he kills his daughters, he cheats his sons. It, it's so over the top that it's kind of hard to take the thing seriously, honestly. You know, the, a lot of times they're real, clearly just uh, printing any gossip they can get. Uh, it's, but I thought I'd read uh, one of the most interesting passages here. Uh, it says, We have a number of incidents connected with the life of Green during his residence in the city from the time he removed from Bloomingdale to the period when he commenced the course of conduct with engi which ended in the terrible tragedy of his wife's murder. We will give these incidents, and when detailed, we will proceed with a full and accurate account of the last and greatest crime of the man, or rather monster, has been guilty. One of the most extraordinary exploits of Green, in which he was engaged shortly after his return to Chicago from Hardscrabble, we were first inclined to withhold, believing that it might throw some doubt upon the authenticity of our history generally. We have, however, concluded to give it to the public since we are fully able to corroborate it on the testimony of some of our most respectable citizens. The exploit to which we allude is that of George W. Green, a wealthy man, stealing the gallows on which John Stone was hung for the murder of Mrs. Thompson in this city in the summer of 1840. The gallows had been erected in the southern part of the city by Mr. Isaac R. Gavin, the sheriff, and remained upon the ground for some time subsequent to the execution. Mr. Daniel B. Hart, commonly known as Popcorn Hart, purchased the gallows of the sheriff and proceeded to the spot where it stood with his team in order to draw it off. He found, however, that somebody had been beforehand with him and subsequently learned that Green had actually stolen it and that by that time it had probably been worked up into articles of furniture for the use of our citizens generally. Now, this is interesting, just even that they remember the uh, Lucretia Thompson and John Stone hanging of 1840. Now, this was 15 years ago. As of 1855, Chicago has like 100,000 people in it. 1840 was like 5,000, so whoever is writing this book, the odds that they were even around for that hanging are really fairly slim. Um, the fact that they even got the names and the dates right there are pretty impressive. Now, uh, one other thing that jumps out of this is uh, Daniel B. Hart, with two T's, commonly known as Popcorn Hart. I could not find any other references to the guy ever going by Popcorn Hart, so if that was one of his real nicknames and this is the one place that is preserved, I'm glad we were able to find that someplace anyway. Um, it goes on like this with one wild incident after another. The book's got George Green, um, you know, lopping the feet off of geese just for the fun of it, um, torturing dogs, uh, murdering a couple of neighbors, like uh, trying to spike an, a neighbor's stack of flyer, flour with arsenic to kill them all, plus all of their guests just because he didn't like the noise they were making. He's very much like a Daniel Quilp, Wackward Squeers type of, uh, type, type of Charles Dickens villain, really. Oh, which gives me a chance here to plug another event that's coming up. That we'll have details on this, I think, on Monday. Uh, there's going to be an event called Drink Like the Dickens that I'm doing with uh, Atlas Obscura and a fantastic restaurant called Knife and Tine. Uh, there's all these uh, weird cocktails in the works of Charles Dickens, um, like Pearl and Dog's Nose and Smoking Bishop. And we're actually going to be serving these things. We're going to have a night at uh, Knife and Tine called Drink Like the Dickens. Uh, the mixologist there, Nicole Allen, is going to be doing uh, four particular Dickens cocktails, including the Rocky Mountain Sneezer, which is what Charles Dickens drank in America to try to cure him of his cold. So it's like, uh, it, it, I don't know if it cures what ails you, but it'll make you drunk enough that you don't even really, man, don't even really mind. Um, 
It was like three different kinds of liquor plus a handful of snow. They're also going to have a food buffet. Uh, they just sent me over uh, a list of what they're uh, of what kind of things they're going to be making. Uh, I actually talked with uh, Lucinda Dickens Hawksley, uh, Charles Dickens' third grade granddaughter, to ask about uh, what kind of food we would serve at something like this. And she suggested white bait. So they're going to have white bait fritters. There's also going to be figgy bread pudding, gruel shooters. I can't wait to see what a gruel shooter is, and roasted chestnuts, bangers, and mash. You know, great Dickensian food. Uh, that that's the whole commercial right there. I'll knock off with the uh, mysterious Chicago tours and events commercials now because we're here. To, we're here to talk about unsolved mysteries. We're here to talk about George W. Glean. Um, now, after reading the whole book, there are a couple of mysteries there that I want to talk about, and one of those is whether the body of Mrs. Green was reburied right back in the garden down there at 12th and Loomis, now Roosevelt and Loomis, and whether it was ever actually moved. Now, in those days, you know, uh, 12th and Loomis uh, was really was. Far enough away, far enough out of the city that burying somebody in your backyard wouldn't have really raised any red flags. Uh, Rose Hill Cemetery had not quite been founded at this point. Uh, the city cemetery up on the north side was, but family plots were still uh, were still the kind of thing that came up now and then. And so. The body was exhumed. There's uh, very lurid details about which organs were in what jar in the trial. Uh, the, the guy was given like a mass of stuff that had been taken out of the stomach, plus the liver and the kidneys. These were in earthenware jars that were stopped up with cork. Um, so once they were done with the body, though, I don't really know what they did with it. And my best guess would be at this point, Green had not yet been convicted of murder, so they probably just buried the body back where it was in the first place, out in the garden. So it's entirely possible down there at about Roosevelt and Loomis, there could still be the body of Mrs. Green uh, still down there under the sod. Now, beyond that, here is the biggest twist in the case. This is the one that really shocked me, uh, and the one that I would, uh, the one that I, the one that I think is really worth pursuing a lot. Here's the biggest twist in the case. George Green, as I mentioned, hanged himself in prison. Now, before they took the body down, the police let a guy with a camera in to take a daguerreotype photograph, you know, the old-fashioned little photographs, uh, to take a photograph of the body while it was hanging there. Now, that's shocking enough, honestly, but the newspaper the next day said that if you want to see it, just go down to the portable daguerreotype studio at Random, Randolph and Clark and they'll sell you one. Now, over at Randolph and Clark, like right across the corner from the prison, they had set up this portable photography studio where they were selling copies of photographs of uh, George Green hanging a uh, dead body hanging by its neck in the prison. Now, this isn't the most shocking case of selling postcards of the hanging that I've ever heard of, man, but man, it is right up there. So it's anyone's guess how many copies of this photograph were in circulation at one point. Most of them probably would have burned up in the Great Chicago Fire about 15 years later. But the mystery is, do any of these photographs still survive? Are there any of them out there? Now, from a look around online, I couldn't find anything. But in that 1885 book, The Life of the uh, Chicago Banker George W. Green, there is a woodcut. There's a drawing based on the daguerreotype. Which, if you go online to uh, go online and look at the webpage associated with this podcast, you can actually see the drawing of it that was that was in the book. So we at least know what it looks like. Uh, consider that kind of a warning. It is kind of a, it's uh, not the most gruesome photo in the world. If you, if you peruse blogs like Mysterious Chicago, you've seen worse photos than this. You've definitely seen worse drawings than this. Um, you can see it in a couple of places now. One is the Mysterious Chicago blog. Also, there is now a new edition of Fatal Drop True Tales of the Chicago Gallows, uh, which has now gone up on Amazon as an ebook. And that's got a copy of it in there as well. So, anyway, for more information on this, for a couple of photographs and a, a, more, um, a longer post about George W. Green, just make sure you head on over to MysteriousChicago.com. Uh, that's not only got the George Green stuff in the photograph, it has also got the um, it has also got the information on our upcoming Unsolved Mysteries tour. Where we'll be telling stories like this, and also the H. H. Holmes tour, which I've been running off and on for years, and the Drink Like a Dick, the Dickens event, and the uh, Fatal Drop True Tales of the Chicago Gallows ebook. Um, really, this is all kinds of stuff. This is a one fortuitous uh, particular podcast for me. I can plug all kinds of stuff with this. In this case, I thought it was, it's, it's cool to get this George Green stuff out there. This was such an important case at the time, and now it's just been totally forgotten. Uh, forgotten enough that nobody's even thought to ask whether Mrs. Green is still buried out there over at Roosevelt and Loomis. Um, but anyway, uh, if you want to uh, dig into this, uh, look online. Uh, call some of the antique stores that have a stock of daguerreotypes and see if you can find anything of a guy hanging by his neck in a cell in Chicago. Um, I 
I'm not gonna lie. I, I, I would look if I had to see it. I, I'm the kind of guy, I read all these accounts of public executions. I would never go to one. I could never bring myself to watch something like that. But a photograph from 150 years ago, sure. I'm pretty countless about things from 150 years ago. Uh, more so than I should be, I admit. But anyway, uh, check it out, MysteriousChicago.com. My, na my name is Adam Seltzer, and I will see you next time. Thank mm -hmm. you.